After all, one should have the courage to believe only in what is good. By that, I do not mean one should believe in illusions. I mean one should do only what is true and good and take it for granted that others will do the same. These were the words of a philosophy student who saw the value of life and opposed violence. These were the words of an artist who believed that art and literature should be uncensored. These were the words of a resistor who took responsibility for defending the rights of free speech and protest and paid with her life. These were the words of Sophie Scholl, and this is her legacy. Sophie was born May 9, 1921 in Germany. She had two older sisters and two brothers. Sophie loved nature. Her poems and drawings that survive today are evidence to that fact. Her love of nature would become a motive for her political ideologies later in life. But politics were never a part of Sophie's life as a child. That is until she was 12 when Hitler rose to power. Sophie, like most young people in Germany, was ensnared by the Nazi party's enthusiasm. Along with her siblings, Sophie joined the Hitler Youth. However, unlike most who blindly believed the Nazis' propaganda, Sophie soon began to question her leaders and the anti-Jewish racism promoted by the organization. Sophie Scholl started college at the University of Munich in May 1942. Her brother Hans Scholl also attended this university and introduced Sophie to his circle of friends. These friends were Alexander Schmorl, Christoph Probst, and Willi Graf. Unknown to Sophie, this group of intellectuals, who called themselves the White Rose, distributed at least one anti-Nazi leaflet. Sophie found a copy and confronted Hans, demanding to join them in their fight to spread information about the way the Nazis had disenfranchised their people. Though we are aware that the might of National Socialism must be broken militarily, we seek to achieve a revival of the deeply wounded German spirit from within. Excerpt from the fourth leaflet. In May, June, and July of 1942, the White Rose distributed four leaflets. Sophie became fully involved in the group's activities. Even though she did not write the leaflets, she helped distribute them and manage the group's finances. The leaflets of the White Rose spoke of intellectual freedom and protested the Nazi censorship of art and literature. They criticized their government, making accusations of oppression, something punishable by death in Nazi Germany. They were an extreme act of defiance, demanding rights by informing others, yet not a single weapon was drawn. When interviewed for this documentary, Fred Breinersdorfer, Academy Award-nominated writer and director of the film Sophie Scholl, The Final Days, was asked about the historical significance of the White Rose during World War II. He said, if you compare it to other German resistance movements, you see that the White Rose was the only non-violent group who trust in the power of the words and arguments. Graf Stauffenberg, for example, tried to kill Hitler with a bomb. In the summer of 1942, many White Rose members were deployed to the Russian front as medics, hurled into the heat of war. Sophie would have her own war that summer. In August, Sophie's father was arrested for making a bad remark against Hitler, a violation of the Heimtuck law which banned political slander of the Nazi party. He would spend four months in prison. Sophie stood outside the prison wall and played the song Die Gedanken sind frei on her flute. In English, this means your thoughts are free. In November 1942, Alex, Willi, and Hans returned to Munich. The White Rose was ready to strike again. In the name of German youth, we demand Adolf Hitler's state restore our personal freedom, the most precious treasure that we have, out of which he has swindled us in the most wretched way. Excerpt from the sixth leaflet. Sophie and the White Rose distributed more leaflets in January 1943, this time with the assistance of influential Professor Kurt Huber. Up until this point, the group had not seen any sign of rebellion in the students of Munich, but that changed on January 13th when Nazi official Paul Geisler came to speak to the university students. Geisler intended to inspire enthusiasm for the Nazi party with the students, but things took a turn for the worse when he began to remark about the role of women in Germany. His remarks sent the auditorium into chaos. Most of the female students were arrested, and the male students responded by fighting. Police forces were called to the building, the students left and began to march down the streets of Munich, singing in opposition. What started as a pro-Nazi seminar ended in rebellion. The White Rose was convinced their leaflets had been responsible for this uprising because protests were unheard of in Nazi Germany. They proceeded to distribute more copies of their fifth leaflet. After the Nazis surrendered to the Russians at Stalingrad, they began to make copies of a sixth leaflet. The sixth leaflet would prove to be their last. 
On February 18th, Hans and Sophie filled an empty suitcase with leaflets and went to the upper floor of the university's indoor courtyard. As the lecture hall doors were open, they dropped the leaflets from the balcony. They then hurried down the stairs into the mass of students. Janitor Jacob Schmidt, a dedicated member of the Nazi party, saw them toss the leaflets. He ran after them, yelling that they were under arrest. The shoal stopped and calmly allowed him to lead them away. The Nazi police force, known as the Gestapo, were called, and the Scholls maintained their innocence. Sophie and Hans were then taken to Munich's Gestapo headquarters at Wittelsbach Palace. Sophie was then interrogated by Robert Moore, who led the Gestapo team investigating the leaflets. Sophie was said to have appeared unafraid and calm. She could have maintained her innocence and possibly have been released, but she did something remarkably brave. She took responsibility and told Robert Moore that the leaflets were her and Hans' idea. Sophie took accountability for the group's actions. She never betrayed them. Robert Moore even gave her the chance to repent her actions and rejoin the Nazi party. He told her that she was misguided. Sophie responded by telling him, You are wrong. I would do everything again, exactly the same way. For it is not I who have the wrong philosophy of life. It is you. On February 22nd, Sophie, Hans, and Christoph were taken to their trial. It was only to last a matter of hours. Presiding Judge Roland Freisler was a notorious Nazi official. Dr. Leo Samberger, a witness to the trial, later said, The presiding judge, who acted more like a prosecutor than a judge throughout the trial, asked many insolent questions. The answers were calm, composed, clear, and unflinching. Sophie maintained her demeanor throughout the trial. She wasn't afraid to take responsibility for her actions. She told the judge that somebody had to make a start. What we said and wrote are what many people are thinking. They just don't dare say it out loud. By that afternoon, the trial was over. Sophie, Hans, and Christoph were condemned to death. The prison guards came for the prisoners. One guard described the situation. They were let off, the girl first. She went without the flicker of an eyelash. None of us understood how this could be possible. The executioner said he had never seen anyone meet his end as she did. To the Gestapo, it seemed that the White Rose was dead. They thought that they could extinguish the fire by eliminating the source. But the White Rose was stronger than ever. Inspired by the White Rose's words about freedoms of speech, religion, protest, and press, new resistance groups formed. In the days following Sophie's execution, the words, Shoal lives, you can break the body but never the spirit, were graffitied on the walls of the University of Munich. A portrait of Hitler was also graffiti. The words, Germany's enemy number one, were painted in oil. A group of students from Hamburg were arrested in the fall of 1943. These students called themselves the Hamburg branch of the White Rose. They were arrested for distributing copies of the original group's leaflets. Through insurrection groups like this, the White Rose's leaflets made their way through Europe and eventually reached the United States. The Allied forces began making thousands of copies of the leaflets. During air raids in Germany, some planes would drop leaflets instead of bombs. This is what Sophie would have wanted. Instead of bombs, words of freedom, justice, and nonviolence were raining down on Germany. The White Rose's influence extends even to the modern era. Jude Newborn, an author, compared the Serbian anti-war movement in the 1990s to the White Rose, saying there were a few Serb students fighting against fascism. They were like the White Roses, and they tried to wake up their own country when it was not listening. When interviewed for this documentary, Professor Jult Nag from St. Thomas University was asked about the White Rose's influence in the modern era. He said, Even today, organized protests often originate among university student groups. Think of the Chilean student protests, the student participation in the events of the so-called Arab Spring, or even the Occupy Wall Street movement. Thus, I think we can safely say that Sophie Scholl's willingness to confront and protest injustice thankfully is still with us today, and continues to be a shining example of courage and rectitude. Sophie Scholl believed that words were powerful. She believed that words could change the world more than any weapon could. Her words and the words of Hans, Alex, Christoph, Willi, and Professor Huber survived where they could not. The words of the White Rose preserve its members' spirits, so that new generations may be inspired to stand up against the extreme injustices that may arise in the world of the future. We will not be silent. We are your bad conscience. The White Rose will not leave you in peace.